Yes, I'm talking about a nonviolent revolution of consciousness. Everyone comes to a point in life in which we reflect upon those things that matter. There are some who choose to ignore the depth of this question, and there are others who follow this question into oblivion. Is it possible to walk the middle path, to ask these questions and yet embrace the possibility of never arriving at an answer? Is it possible to live our lives not in the absence of a corrupt world, but despite it? If you were asked to ponder the one thing that matters most in your life, what would it be? Security? Money? Success? Sex? Power? Have you ever considered why? Why we crave? Do we not have enough? What happens when we have all the money, all the security, all the success, sex, power, but haven't found peace? What happens if we gain the world without an ounce of love or appreciation? We end up only wanting more. The world can't give enough of itself, as if humanity is becoming a black hole devouring everything in its path. When we receive these things, our first instinct is to protect them from others. We distrust our neighbors because of them. We wage war to gain more of them. However, love is distinct from these. When love is present, our first instinct is to give back, to help those who long to truly be free, those who desire to give back who desire to know love. But what happens if no one truly wants love anymore? What if no one desired freedom? What if the greatest epidemic known to man has already infected the entire species? A whole race of humanity, conned into believing that slavery is freedom, that fear is love, that suffering is happiness. Would you be able to recognize it if it were happening right now? Ask yourself, is it? Is this the world we live in? You ain't got nothing to live for, you're better off dead. Yes, but what if a man has got something to live for? That's different. Then nothing should stand in his way. Anybody want to take a stab at answering that question? What is freedom? Well, let's take a look at the Oxford definition. Um, the power or right to act, speak, or think freely. The state of being free. Well, that's kind of mechanical. I, I really don't like that definition. So what I did is I said, okay, well, what's the definition of a slave? A person who is a legal property of another and is forced to obey them, or a person who is excessively dependent upon or controlled by something. Okay? So if you're dependent on something, are you free? No. No. If you're controlled by something, are you free? No. No. So if we want to be free, then maybe we need to get rid of our dependencies and the controls in our life. Rob, in the Paget family, is an example of what happens when an average individual begins asking simple questions. Rob has removed himself from under external government and jurisdiction. No officer of the law, judge or magistrate, politician or tax agent has authority over his life simply due to a title. The land on which he lives is treated with respect and appreciation. He has drafted his own declaration of independence and his own constitution. He has truly broken the bonds that fetter so many of us to dependency and dogma. However, to do this, far more than physical barriers had to be destroyed. Upon Rob's realization that he is truly becoming free, an inevitable realization of responsibility presented itself. When excessive dependence upon something is recognized within, the heart and mind revolt. The initiation of an authentic revolution always begins within the individual. Pay attention not to the physical steps he took to become free, but to the spirit of his path. 
for it is a personal path within all of us. If we mimic the path of another, it is not a true path for us, but a trap. This is merely a story of an individual I love and respect, the story of how a true revolution is born. With self-governance, I am 100% responsible and 100% accountable for everything that I say and do. And that's what kind of led to us building the airship and to uh, building a power system and living off-grid. But when we talk about off-grid, it's not just the power grid that we're talking about. You know, there's also the corporate grid. And so myself personally, I've, um, you know, gotten rid of the mortgage, credit cards, loans, bank accounts. Um, I don't have any of those kind of things anymore. So I'm off of the financial grid and I'm off the corporate grid as much as possible as well. If I started like growing our own food, generating our own power, then we're not susceptible to disruptions in the grid should there be a failure. And because of its complexity, the probability of that happening is increasing over time. The complexity of a system is a direct reflection of the amount of burden that the people are placing upon the system. Every government would have to grow if you keep placing more burden upon it. All of that burden is actually the responsibility that we no longer, as the citizens, want to take care of on our own anymore. We want our government to take care of it for us. So all of that burden feeds the system and that's how the system grows. If a system is becoming faulty, if a system is becoming corrupt, that's because the foundation or the soil that that system has grown out of has become faulty and has become corrupt. So that's the first place that we need to start looking, is the foundation, the soil that this system grew out of. We need to start looking at the people. down in, in the U.S., uh, Taos, New Mexico, he's an architect. His, his, what he's doing is he's building earth ramp houses which are passively solar heated out of automobile tires. And you stack the tires like bricks, pack them full of dirt, and they're backfilled, and um, they're completely off-grid. The sun heats the dirt and the mass, and that heat then radiates back into the house. And then in the winter time, because the sun is so low, it penetrates deep into the building to warm up the building. In the summertime, it's really high, so it doesn't penetrate the building at all and it keeps the building cool. And, uh, you know, collect water off the roof into cisterns, and we recycle water in the house and, you know, solar panels for power generation. So the house essentially is like a self contained ecosystem because it collects its own water, treats its own waste, generates its own power, generates its own heat and it's all built out of recycled materials that are abundant out in our ecology. There's automobile, automobile tires all over the place, right? So you're trying to build houses out of materials that you can find readily laying around. My wife is studying to be a homeopath at the time and she started recognizing that there are a few things that are going on in the medical industry that isn't necessarily good for us and through the process of learning about some of the medical issues that we were learning through Carrie's education uh, it started to wake us up to some of the other things going on in our economy and in our political system and that kind of stuff. It's not a healthcare system, but a keep you sick system so that they can make lots of money through pharmaceuticals. I held on to crap in my life, and whether it's emotional or mental, and my body had a real hard time 
dealing with it. You know, I've since learned that it's holding on to that stuff is what causes cancer and, you know, all kinds of uh, illnesses and uh, distress on the physical body. So we decided to take our matters into our own hands and, and be responsible rather than react to what was going on. We decided to uh, be proactive. And so we came out while the economy was at its hottest and we sold everything, came out here. That all stemmed really from some of the things that Carrie was bringing back from her studying. And she brought this term natural person back from school and said, hey Rob, you know, have you heard of this? Uh, no. So I started looking into it and realizing that there's this huge deception going on in the political arena well, and, and the medical arena and the economy and all that kind of stuff too. But my initial reaction was I was extremely angry and upset. How, how dare they do this? You know, they're supposed to be there to protect us and guide us and help us, not manipulate us. And that's kind of started my road towards trying to understand their system and uh, learn what human rights is all about and what freedom is all about. What is the law? What laws apply to every single man on this earth? Because they often say no man is above the law. Okay, so which law are they talking about then? Well, there's common law, there's civil law, there's contract law, there's Sharia law, there's Christian law, like there's all kinds of laws. Mm -hmm. Admiralty is just one of them. And when it comes down to it, uh, a lot of those are only associated to activities depending on what we're doing and what we consent to. So corporations, for example, are all subject to a number of laws um, because they are the creation of the government. So the master gives the rules for the servant to follow. Okay. So does that apply to you? Well, unless you're a corporation or you're behaving as a corporation, the answer is no. So I asked the question, what is the law? The history of law gives us an understanding of its evolution, which is intimately linked to the evolution of our species. The function of law does not simply govern our physical actions. We have many layers of existence, including physical, mental, emotional, conscious, and spiritual. Because we cannot escape any of these, an affliction to one of them reverberates in consequence between all of them. It is irresponsible to assume that law pertains only to portions of our lives. Law is the very foundation of life itself. All law forms today are based upon our consent. Should the people of today discover the important truth that we can say no at any time, we may find a revolution within the current system to be inevitable. Everything we are experiencing is the evolution of experience itself. This is why I can't say what the future should look like. The second I give a model for the future, there will instantly appear a rebellion against that model. And that rebellion is very important because the future is not about ending up with a beautiful result. It's about learning from the process and allowing that process to always welcome change. There are three fundamental stages to our evolution, childhood, adulthood, and parenthood or leadership. A child is typified by being dependent upon external support for food, protection, and health. In the animal kingdom, the transition from childhood to adulthood is complete when the child is no longer dependent upon others to be fed, protected, and kept in good health. We are a species of perpetual children today in our society. And as easy as it would be to blame the political, economic, and societal system that breeds dependent people, it is an inescapable truth that the entire system is a reflection of the condition of its people. Seldom do we see adults today in the sense that they can govern themselves, which means 
it is even less frequent that we see individuals fit for parenthood or leadership. The stage of parenthood and leadership comes when not only can we govern ourselves, but when we are ready and willing to help others become self-governing. The leaders of today are unfortunately nothing more than children with adult bodies wearing leadership clothes. Our entire species is being faced with a choice, govern the self or be governed by others. The problem with courts these days that I see is that people don't see them for what they really are. Um, I was raised to respect authority, follow the authority, and do as they say. And I think most people are brought up that way. What I've learned though is that that authority is based 100% on our consent to being governed. And I found a Supreme Court ruling that says that the consent of the governed is a foundational principle of democracy. Now, what's consent? Does that imply that you have a choice whether you're going to agree to that or not? And I would suggest that the answer is yes. So we all have free will choice to consent to being governed. When we do that, then We've given them permission to use their authority over us. So when we used our free will to apply for or register for something, we gave them permission to create a corporation to interact between the man and the system. And it's that corporation that the system acts upon. But because we don't know who we are, we assume or we think that that is us. So when you take a look at your credit card or take a look at your driver's license or your birth certificate or any of that kind of stuff, a lot of people, and including myself, thought that that was actually me. And that's not true. So when the courts are acting upon it, all they can really act upon is the corporation and the only reason they can act upon the man is because we agree to be the representative of that corporation and bind ourselves to the uh, terms and conditions of that agreement but we can say no at any time give the public the facts they have a right to know Got it? If you have those documents, such as licenses, registrations, permits, applications, that is your consent to being governed by certain guidelines, regulations, acts, stipulations, laws within that corporation because you are asking for a service and they're saying, okay, as long as you follow these rules. If you sign any of those contracts which are represented by a legal fiction set up in your name, then you, yourself, are bound by those rules, bound by those regulations, because you did that. You consented to being governed by that. So in order to remove yourself from that, you have to dissolve those contracts. Sometimes they make it seem mandatory that you must comply, and it's just the language that's being used. That's one thing you want to become very wary of, is the language that they use. was to ask you how do you define person what would the normal definition of in our community be for that word human being. human being and if we take a look at the dictionary it says a human being regarded as an individual that's what we would normally view the word person to be in law okay now we're using their words whenever you're dealing with corporations and the government and all that kind of stuff Person means an individual or incorporated group having certain legal rights and responsibilities. Not a human being regarded as an individual, but as 
an individual or a corporation. So they actually said, compare artificial person and natural person. So I did. So I looked it up and I compared them. Artificial person. A legal entity, not a human being. Natural person. A natural person is a human being that has the capacity for rights and duties. Just because you have the capacity doesn't mean that you're going to use your free will to exercise them. You have the capacity for rights and duties, but it's up to you to exercise them. I actually uh, found the legal dictionary that they use in the U.S. So every time they argue about the definition of a word, yeah, it's it's a volume that's as long as my arms of books. So by curiosity, I looked up the word person. And on each page, there was probably, I would estimate, about 15 different definitions with each court case. And the word person ran for around 200, 250 pages. So there was literally thousands of different definitions for the word person. How can anybody possibly learn all that in order to protect yourself? Well, part of the Magna Carta uh, states that to none will we sell or deny a right or a justice. Well, what that means is that if you want to exercise your rights and you want to have justice, they can't sell it to you. They sure do now. It costs you hundreds of dollars an hour to hire a lawyer just so you can get justice. Sometimes there are things that are more important than bread and butter. Just what, for instance? The right to think for yourself. This is a free country where nobody can set themselves up as absolute ruler and force other people to do their bidding. And as our country grows, more and more you will find men and women marching and fighting side by side. So at the revolution, the sovereignty devolved devolved on the people, and they are truly the sovereigns of the country, but they are sovereigns without subjects, with none to govern but themselves. The citizens of America are equal as fellow citizens. And this was a U.S. case in, what's the year, 1793. So every U.S. individual is sovereign if they knew about it and if they hadn't got hooked into the corporate game that's being played down. So, a sovereign, a person, body, or state vested with independent and supreme authority. So, if you're sovereign, does that mean that somebody else has authority over you? No. You have the supreme authority. What about an officer of the law? They have no authority over you. They're your That's servant, awesome. okay? But what they do is they try to get you into a contract so that you contract away your rights so that they then have authority over you. Asking for a driver's license, insurance, and registration. If you give it to them, that's a contract. You then gave them authority. Then they can do whatever they want to. We elected to take responsibility and accountability for anything that should happen, as, as we should because it's our building, and we're building it. Um, so we essentially went ahead with it and waited for the county to say something. About three, four months into the project, we received a letter. That letter essentially indicated that we noticed that you're, there's some development um, please stop the development until you fill in a development permit. Well, I had been studying uh, my human rights for a couple of years at that point, so I rent sent them a letter uh, essentially outlining that uh, I am a individual, not a person or a corporation, and that you don't have jurisdiction over anything that I do, and that uh, your letter also indicated that if you know if I sign this, you have permission to come on our property. So that implies that you currently don't have permission to come on our property. So I essentially told them, you know, you're gonna have to provide me with a proof of your claim that I have to 
uh, follow the guidelines of the Municipality Act and they do not have permission to come onto our property. About a week later, the tax assessor showed up and I asked him, well, are you, he are you here as an agent of the county? And he said, yes. And I said, well, can you tell me which parts of the act that your authority comes from? And so he told me, and I said, tell you what, um, let me look those up and I'll get back to you. And he was quite reasonable, he agreed with that, and he left without any incident. So I looked up the act and found out that he had to give me, you know, reasonable notice. And uh, because he was an agent, uh, I had already told the county that they didn't have permission to come on the property. So I had grounds for several charges, if I wanted to, of trespassing and, and breach of the Municipality Act against this guy. So I confronted him on it. The final result was I got a letter from the minister uh, indicating that, that I had several good points in my letter and that he encouraged me to settle my dispute with the county and he essentially washed his hands of the whole thing. And I haven't heard from the county since. They've left me alone now for two years. I can't have freedom unless I also recognize that I have a duty. And I have a duty to share with people what I've learned uh, from not only the legal aspect, but also the spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical freedoms that I've been working on. I felt that part of my duty was to start getting out there and start teaching this. Petro. Yes, sir. Stand by for operation of the time machine. Yes, sir. Where to this time, Captain? Back to the year 1215 in King John of England. Yes, sir. Uh, everybody's familiar with Robin Hood. Um, King John, you know, the, the tyrant, was actually real. The problem with King John is that he did not know how to fight a war and he had no land to his name. Um, so he ran to the Pope in uh, 1213 and asked Pope Innocent III for some help. And what he did is he actually turned over the whole Kingdom of England to the Pope in return for support from the Pope so that he could fight his wars. So that little document essentially turned King John into the Pope's vassal, which, mean, which means that he promised to be loyal to the Pope and the Pope then owned everything in England. A couple years later, his barons, uh, you know, quartered him and you know stuck a knife to him and said, "You know what? Uh, we're not happy with the way you're treating us. We want you to sign this Magna Carta." But if I sign this, I shall be no king. You have given me four and twenty overlords. These twenty-four will see that you carry out the terms of the Magna Carta. You have no choice, King John, but to sign. So the Magna Carta was the basis of English law. That's right, Jet. And the basis of American law as well. The English Magna Carta became the model for the American Bill of Rights. This is the founding document for our human rights within our country, within Great Britain, within the United States, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, any crown colony, their legal systems are based on this document. But he was doing it at knife point. He's under duress. Is that a legal contract? No. no. So I have a question. If it was under duress and this is not a legal contract, then how can they possibly continue using this document as the basis for our legal system? I would suspect that most people would recognize that a valid contract would require that the individual sign on his own free will. And that wasn't the case. And the Pope at the time, Pope Innocent III, recognized that as such because he also uh, said that it was invalid.
kings of Europe decided, you know what, there's this huge piece of land just across the Atlantic Ocean, let's go get it. And so how they did it though is they chartered corporations, you know, the king set up a corporation and it was funded by the king and bankers and that kind of stuff and they came over and they stuck the flag into the ground and say, you know, we claim this for the king of England and set up shop and started dealing with the First Nations people that are here. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into all the atrocities that, ha that happened. Literally millions of First Nations people died, other as a result of disease, wars, starvation. And so that genocide took place just so that they can colonize this land. You know, it's, it's a sad chapter in our history. Uh, but we also have to recognize that that's the past and so let's move on and let's try to live in harmony with one another now without pushing our will against another and try to come to terms with the things that were done in the past. It was essentially the corporation that came and, and conquered this country, or this land I should say, not the country. They came and conquered this land. It was all corporations that came. Now that those corporations are here, people started coming over and started immigrating to what they thought was Canada or the United States. And then in 1867, they passed this thing called the British North America Act. Now, did the people here vote on this? No. This is a piece of legislation from Great Britain. That's all this is. The BNA Act is just legislation from the Parliament in Great Britain. But it was passed off on us as a constitutional document. In order for you to have a constitution, the people have to vote on the document, not the representatives in the legislature. This document merged all the colonies into one colony called Canada. That's all this document did. But it was passed off as forming a country. The people of Great Britain went and started traveling around the world and bringing their legal system with them. And <clears throat> even though the U.S. declared their independence in 1776, they still based their legal system on British system. They're all based on that common law system, but there's also the Admiralty system that came with it. Representatives from you know Canada, Australia, uh, South Africa, New Zealand, you know all those got together with Great Britain and started talking about okay uh, how can we really set things up so that we can be autonomous from Great Britain and so they actually met for a couple of years 1926 and 1930 to formulate how this is going to work and then the king then passed the statute of Westminster and that essentially broke the tie between Great Britain and Canada. Okay, The king is no longer uh, a part of Canada. Canada is no longer affected by any statutes or regulations from Great Britain. Because the link to the crown was broken, technically we are in anarchy. We have no document to actually set up the framework for how our government is supposed to operate in this land. In 47, they wrote a letters patent creating the office of Governor General. The Governor General is the head of this country. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense established. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. There's not one piece of territory or one thing 
of a monetary nature that we want out of this war. We want peace and prosperity for the world as a whole. Let's go through these, through these words and let's see if you understand them now. Okay. Governor, general. What's a general? Military. Lieutenant. More generals. What's a company? It's like four brigades of man and heavy equipment. An officer. Okay. The taxpayer is actually an officer who holds an office. Commission. How many here work for commission? Under a social insurance number? So you're actually a commissioned officer. Okay, so even some of the financial terms are, have military connotations. And it's all done under admiralty, which is military. When you turn 18 and you start working in, under a social insurance number or accept a birth certificate, you're actually accepting uh, being posted at a military post, evidenced by a name, address, and a date of birth. Because what was birthed? The vessel, right? It's a military vessel. So when you agree to be the legal representative of that military vessel, you agree to be manning that military post. Okay, that's why they need the name and birth date so that they can prove that you're a private in their military. All of these documents, whether you're registering property or applying for driver's licenses, a birth certificate, all that kind of stuff, it's all in the public, which means it's all on the military side, and you're holding military offices when you have these documents on your possession. As long as you're manning a military post, technically you're at war. So, uh, Clause 1 says, we do hereby constitute. Who's we? I don't remember seeing any documentation that said the people of this land gave them permission to constitute that office. And the king doesn't have any authority here because of the uh, statute of Westminster 1931 cut off all of that. So I have a question. Who's we? I suspect that it was... Uh, Prime Minister Mackenzie King and all of his cronies. So how did all this happen? Um, this guy here, uh, our Prime Minister Mackenzie King, uh, I did some reading on him and uh, I found out he's actually really good friends with uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. and he actually spent a lot of time in New York. He actually uh, consulted with him. He, he, uh, Mackenzie King's a lawyer and he was actually Rockefeller's lawyer and uh, actually helped him out with a lot of uh, uh, labor disputes that are happening in the States. So who signed it? Prime Minister of Canada. So our Prime Minister signed a letters patent to create the office of Governor General. They needed to set up another office. So the Prime Minister did it. And I'm really curious to find out who was supporting him to do that because it wasn't the people and it wasn't the king. Even though he said by his majesty's command, I question that too. Governor General's Act, you go to a Canadian government website and you can actually look up the acts, okay? You look up the Governor General's Act. And in there, clause one, or clause two says, the Governor General of Canada or other chief executive officer, CEO, CEOs are for companies or administrator carrying on the government of Canada on behalf and in the name of the sovereign by whatever title designated is a corporation sole. Okay, a corporation sole is a corporation except there's only one individual that holds that title or owns that corporation. Corporation souls actually are used all over the place. The Pope the office of the Pope is a corporation soul. The office of the King is a corporation soul. The Governor General, Lieutenant Governors, um, the, the Catholic Church, all of their bishops and archbishops and cardinals, they all hold corporation souls.
Uh, this was on the Governor General's website about um, 10 months ago. I, you won't find it now because they changed it. <laughs> so I'm really glad I got a screenshot of it. But it says here, Canada is a parliamentary democracy and a constitutional monarchy. Yeah, what, right, whatever. This means Canadians recognize the Queen as our head of state. Canada's Governor General carries out Her Majesty's duties in Canada on a daily basis and is Canada's de facto head of state. <laughs> Does everybody know what de facto means? Illegitimate but in effect. So it has no legitimacy, but because we've all accepted it, that gives it force and effect. Now as soon as you get away from all the people and you remove yourself or segregate yourself through a private agreement or what have you, um, that becomes private. Now the Governor General and the Queen by definition are only responsible for the public. Government is there to, to deal with the public for us but they've turned everything public. As soon as you register property, like land or vehicles or any of that kind of stuff, you turn that into a registered item which is in the public. If you're in the public, they assume that you're vulnerable and that you need protecting from others and from yourself. As soon as you're using all of your corporations, that's all on the public side and that's all governed by the public, which is the government. So part of the process that I went through was to actually explicitly say, I do not want to be governed. This is the fundamental rule of all forms of law. Without your consent, you cannot be governed. There is not a single law in existence created by man that is mandatory. There are many that give the illusion of being mandatory, but therein lies the most important aspect to all of this. It is your responsibility to investigate and understand what governs you. Not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, consciously, and spiritually. There are tyrannical governments that force their law upon the people unjustly. Some do not have much of a choice to move away from these areas. However, most do have a choice, yet allow justifications to keep them exactly where they are. If we were on a train track just minutes away from being hit, most of us would move, yet some have the tendency to complain about how inconvenient it is to move. There is still a choice. Human ingenuity can surmount any obstacle. The only requirement is the desire to surmount. If we are willing to complain or rebel against a system that governs our actions, we should know how and why it does so. In doing this, it is important to understand who we are, where we are, and what options we have. Well, what's Canada defined as? In the Interpretation Act, Canada, for greater certainty, includes the internal waters of Canada and territorial sea of Canada. Okay? Now that word includes is a tricky word. There's a legal maxim that says the inclusion of one is the exclusion of all others. Okay, so whenever you see the word includes, it means it's this and nothing else. Hold on here. You're trying to tell me that Canada is just water? Yes, it is. This red, that's Canada. We, sitting in this basement, we are not in Canada. Well, the term Turtle Island, my understanding, is an actual word that the First Nations people called North America. When the Europeans came over, they then started putting their own terms and words to the land. 
However, it was all done through corporations. Well, that's why they need the Admiralty Courts, because Canada is only water. You can't have law of the land if you have no land. You need Admiralty Courts to operate in Canada because it's all water. You need your ships. Okay. Everybody know where they fly the flag on the Parliament buildings in Ottawa? Yeah. No. On the top of the Peace Tower. Because they don't have any land to pl plant their flag. We need land to plant a flag. Take a look at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. You type in the word Canada, it's listed there. Canada actually has to file with the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission every year. The Admiralty Courts are set up to govern business between corporations, not people. The jurisdiction of Admiralty Courts does not deal with human affairs. Only when humans, knowingly or unknowingly, represent a corporation by using licenses, registrations, certificates, and applications, do they fall under admiralty jurisdiction. It is a well-disguised fact that nearly everything we believe to be our country, our courts, our police departments, and even the documents that represent us as individuals are in fact corporations in the business for profit. Should you choose to remain a part of any of these corporations, it's important to understand that not only are you under their jurisdiction, but you do gain the benefits that they offer. The benefits in the agreement of becoming a citizen of any country is their protection. To be a citizen of any nation means that you have your citizenship. This ship is a vessel that contains your consent to be protected and governed by that nation. It was November of 07 when I actually got pulled over by city police. You know, they had two or three police cars there. But what essentially happened is he came up to the, to the window and said, you know, asked me for my driver's license, insurance, and registration. And I actually told him, well, I don't have a driver's license. And he goes, yeah, that's why I stopped you. I'm not a corporation. And I do know that I'm not here to submit to other people's authority. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was actually testifying to him. I didn't need to tell him that I didn't have any of those documents. At that point, he then asked me, well, what's your name? Well, I told him, well, my friends call me Rob. I don't let a, a name define me, or I don't let a career define me. I'm not a name or a label. Again, I was testifying, I, you know, I didn't have to disclose to him my identity, but it was enough information for him to make the link between that name and the name that he has jurisdiction over, which is the artificial person that was on the driver's license that was expired. And that was grounds enough for him to proceed with filing charges of driving without a driver's license. And he essentially gave me to the count of three to accept these, or he would continue filing more charges and tow the vehicle. And I finally accepted under, you know, I was extremely stressed out at that point because I didn't want to lose my property and that kind of stuff. So I accepted them and decided to deal with it through letters. Like if I was a judge, for example, and you walked in and, and claimed that you're sovereign, one of the things I'm going to look at is, okay, has this guy behaved like a sovereign? Did he, you know, provide me with a uh, pre-notice and you know try to resolve the issue before it even came to court and was he honorable in his communications and his interactions with people. So at that point I started a letter campaign uh, writing letters to him to ask him to, you know for proof of claim of a whole bunch of things that he was claiming over me and he essentially ignored all of those um, so I showed up in court for the plea Okay, now I know what the plea is all about, right? So I didn't go in there with all my books. I essentially went in there to essentially say, you know what, there is no harm done here. There's no cause in f for this uh, court to be hearing. The judge wouldn't hear any of that. 
he kept asking me for the person Robert Ernest Page and I kept saying well I'm here on this behalf because I'm not that person I'm I'm man but he finally said to me okay you know what I'm entering in a plea well, first off that was probably a no-no on his part and he told me to plead guilty but he said that from the facts of the case it didn't look like I had a chance then he told me make sure that that person is in court you know, I was still nervous, I was still shaken and that kind of stuff, but I left court excited because I successfully got the judge to recognize me for who I am, not as that artificial person. But I still have court to deal with. So when I got there, the Crown called me up, so I went up there. This is before the judge was there. And uh, he asked me for my name. I didn't give him a name, I told him I'm a third party intervener under injury because the artificial person's being called to court, not me. But I'm the one that was injured. I was stopped, which is an injury, uh, detained for an hour and a half, and had to go through a whole bunch of letters and that kind of stuff. So he pointed to the ticket and it goes, well, is that you? And I told him, that is not me. And I think he's getting frustrated. So Go sit down. So I went and sat down. All I know is that when they resumed court, they heard the rest of the cases, and then they called Robert Ernest Page up, and I stood up, and she turned to me and said, case dismissed on lack of evidence. I move for an immediate dismissal. There's no sound basis for this case. There's not the slightest evidence. That was tremendous feather in my cap because I was able to successfully uh, stand as a man in front of them without them intimidating me and let them know that I know how this game works now. Never a few men try to take over the rights of honest citizens. They always fail. They sure do. The created cannot be greater than the Creator. Whether you believe in God or Allah or Mother Earth or whatever, uh, that's your Creator. I believe in God. God's my Creator. And even right in the Bible, um, Genesis 1.27 says God created man in his own image. Well, since man was created in the image of the Divine King, delegated sovereignty or kingship was bestowed on him. So I believe that the Creator created each and every one of us as kings and queens. Okay? That means there's absolutely nobody between me and my Creator. Okay? If I have somebody in between, then I have more than one master. Masters could be the pursuit of money. Uh, money would be a, one master that I used to bow to. I would do anything for money. Um, other people. Um, I used to submit myself to other people's authority without even question. Um, whether that be, you know, a teacher or politician or police or whatever. Um, does that mean I don't respect them? No. Um, I honor them for who they are and what they're doing and the path and the journey that they're on. But does that mean I have to bow to them as a master? No. Anything one fears could be construed as a master. But that also means that our creations are our servants, okay? We created government, 
We created the corporations. We created all the bylaws and the legislation. Okay? They're there to serve us. Um, we're not completely out of it yet. We still have dependencies on you know, our internet connections and our phone bills because we still want to communicate with people. But for the most part, I've been able to unwind myself from the vast majority of all of those uh, requirements that most people have. Years ago, I was very materialistic. I was, you know, working hard for, you know, big houses, big cars, lots of money, that kind of stuff. And then when I recovered from my depression, I realized that life is all about my relationships. Relationships with individuals like yourself, other my friends and family, um, but also with relationships with my food or my environment. Um, sometimes I still struggle with that. Um, you know, this is a journey. It's not something that's, you know, open a door, walk through, you're, you're changed man. And, you know, this is something I'll probably have to struggle with the rest of my life. Every once in a while I stumble, but I, I see it for what it is and forgive myself and just move on. And that whole entire process was a lot of hard work. Like it was extremely painful, took a lot of energy, but I'm at a point right now where if I had to do it again, I would, because I learned so much about myself. And it positioned me very well to actually get together again with my wife. We were separated for three years. Uh, we reconciled the marriage and, um, you know, we've been going strong now for almost 10 years. I believe the solution's available for anybody, whether you live in a, you know, democratic society or under a dictatorship or whatever. I believe the solution's simple. And I believe the solution is within ourselves. There are billions of people wandering this globe with perspective, scope, belief, dogma, morals, fears, desires, and hidden agendas. It's difficult to comprehend exactly what drives each of them. When looking at the surface of this unique condition the planet is in due to only one species, it may seem as if we aren't truly interested in freedom anymore. Maybe we're not truly working towards growth, prosperity, and peace. Again, it's difficult to pinpoint why we are a species of perpetual war and perpetual deceit, matched by perpetual heroism and perpetual compassion. There is no one answer to explain it all, and yet even if there were, it wouldn't be the intellectual answer that we desperately want it to be. The most we can do as individuals is to begin acting like individuals instead of acting like machines on autopilot from some primal program set in motion millions of years ago. What would this planet look like if we took back the one power we consistently give away? Choice. Because there is always a choice. Good, bad, indifferent, there is always a choice. Love, fear, growth, decay, life and death, there is always a choice. And the picture-perfect ending or eternal struggle is but a consequence of the direction we choose to travel from here. So rather than looking at fear, right now look at this as the moment of opportunity because there's something so much better on the horizon, but we can only get there by eliminating the structure as it is now because the structure as it is now is providing for our extinction. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the small undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. I had to be willing to accept what other people had to say. Uh, 
do critical thinking to evaluate whether it's true or not. Um, I had to learn. I had to learn how to change. Um, I had to face my fear and confront my fear. Um, I had to be honest with myself, which was difficult. I had to learn how to let go. Um, and I had to learn to stand up for what I believe. And I had to learn that it all took hard work to get through all of that. Yes, I'm talking about a nonviolent revolution of consciousness. A consciousness that is able to understand how we're all inextricably connected to each other on this earth and to the earth itself. And that if we violate those fundamental principles, we do so at our own peril. Yes, we can continue to live in this delusion and the denials of reality because it's painful. It's frightening. Sometimes it's terrifying. It's terrifying to face the truth. So I ask each of you to search your hearts as to what your truth is for being a citizen of the earth, promoting justice as a foundation for peace. It's not going to happen magically. And I think it's not going to happen by relying on these political structures and institutions. I think we're going to have to wage peace in the most extraordinary ways, whether our government wants it or not. You will know in your heart what to do, but I know that without a nonviolent revolution of consciousness, we will not survive as a civilization or as a planet. We can choose to have peace if we want to pay the price. And what more glorious goal and value do we want than peace for all people? And so I look forward to working together with you all with we the people, to build a new society, a society that understands that we are not worth more and they are not worth less, and that we will be willing to pay the price and take the risks to wage peace with all fellow and sister human beings.